Hello students, I am Dr. Shayanti Talwar. Welcome to this session which is going to be on Northrop Fry's uh, critical essay, Criticism Visible and Invisible. So to give you just a kind of context to the essay, Northrop Fry uh, was a Canadian critic and he was a propagator or a believer of the archetypal uh, school of criticism. So according to Fry, uh, what criticism can essentially do is to awaken students to successive levels of awareness of the mythology that lies behind the ideology in which their society indoctrinates them. So what he believed was that whatever literary texts are out there or they are whatever literary texts have been created they are a they are all replications or copies of mythology and if students become aware of the mythology that underlies these texts if they start looking at the underlying patterns then that is when they can understand the texts better and they can experience the texts better. So he felt that it was criticism's job to make students aware of the mythological truth of texts. And uh, uh, so he, uh, there is a, a paraphrase of the earlier point. So uh, the description also says the same thing. The study of recurring structural patterns grants students an emancipatory distance from their own society and gives them a vision of a higher human state which is the Longinian, almost like the Longinian sublime that is not accessible directly through their own experience but ultimately transforms and expands their experience. So he says the moment students start tracing or uh, people who, are, who read literature start tracing the recurring, recurring is repetitive structural patterns uh, in literary texts that te they can distance themselves from it. It creates a distance between the uh, uh, society and the student and this distance is very liberating. The student uh, feels free through this distance because the student gets a more uh, holistic perspective, a higher vision of uh, the truth and this truth will not be accessible to the student if the student keeps looking at a text through their own experience. However, the higher vision is going to expand the student's level of experience. Now, I know this might sound a little complicated, but we are going to look at uh, the, we are going to understand this idea better through, the, through his critical essay, uh, Criticism Visible and Invisible, in which he propounds this theory. So in this essay, what are we going to focus on? A, we focus on what uh, Fry calls Nous and Dionia, and he's not the first one to make this differenti differentiation. This differentiation has uh, been around since Plato's time. Uh, times. The second thing what he does is he critiques pedantry. Now we will look in great detail at what is pedantry. The third thing that Fry wants to convey through this particular essay is that he wants to advocate a more flexible kind of criticism rather than evaluative or judicial criticism. He would like uh, so he doesn't want dogmatic criticism or criticism that judges works. He, he proposes a new framework of criticism, which we will see um, in the course of this session. And finally, he distinguishes between lower limit, that is visible criticism, and higher limit, which is invisible criticism. And that's how this get, the essay gets its, gets its name, visible and invisible, right? So, uh, so how does he, uh, what is meant by news and dionia? Okay, so news is knowledge of things and dionia is knowledge about things. So just bear this in mind that these are two different things. You can 
uh, have knowledge of things and you can have knowledge about things. So what happens in the case of the latter or knowledge about things? Knowledge about things presumes that the object and the subject are different. So if I know about something, I know about the computer okay, or the laptop. So it means I am not the same as the laptop. There is a distance, there is a separateness between me and the laptop, right? So there is a split between subject and object, which is in fact the first fact of ordinary consciousness. So in knowledge about things, I learn that what I learn is an objective body of facts and essentially they are unrelated to me. On the other hand, if I have to speak of knowledge of things, that is news, it implies some kind of identification or essential unity of subject and object. So we will look, uh, we will explore this idea more deeply with several examples so that it becomes clearer. So like I said, if I know about something, there is a separateness between me and that something. But if I know of something, that is if I am experiencing news, it means the sub the subject, uh, the object of my knowledge and the subject, which is me, are one and the same. Okay. Now, this has to apply in case of literature. So, here when he says knowledge of and knowledge about, he is referring to literature. So, knowledge of literature and knowledge about literature. So, first he says, learning about things is the necessary and indispensable prelude to the knowledge of things. So, one thing is very clear that unless you start with knowledge about things, you can never make the journey to knowledge of things. So, what is the first step? That I need to know about something. Okay. And then only I can graduate or I can rise to the level of knowing of it. So, then secondly, he says is knowledge about things is the limit of teaching. Because knowledge of things, which comes after knowledge about things, that cannot be taught. So, uh, to make this very simple, what he says is, if I am an English teacher and I am teaching a poem in class, I can only tell you about the poem. So, I can give you knowledge about the poem. So, I can talk about the writer, about, uh, sorry, I can talk about the poet, I can talk about the society um, which the poet belonged to, I can talk about the political events maybe that took place when this poem was written, I can talk about uh, how uh, how people, uh, what kind of cultural sensibility people had when this poem was written, I can talk about the language used in the poem, I can talk about my understanding of the poem and that is all I can do. That is the limit of my teaching, this part a particular poem to you. I cannot make you experience the poem firsthand. That is for you to do. So, knowledge of things cannot be taught, right? Thirdly, Noose is or is usually considered to be the same knowledge as Dionia. It is the relation between knower and known that is different. The difference is that something conceptual has become existential. So, he is trying to say that he, he, I, whether it is Noose or whether it is Dionia, the object of knowledge is the same. So, it is the same poem. Whether you are approaching it as news or whether you are approaching it as dynia, it's the same poem. Okay, but where is the difference, the relationship between the reader and the poem? So, in the first case, uh, in dynia's case, the reader knows about the poem, and in this, uh, in the case of news, the reader experiences the poem firsthand. The poem does something to the reader. Okay, so which means a concept which is out there has become a part of the reader. 
so it's almost like this that this is dynia okay this glass of water which is outside me so i can talk about it i can look at it i can describe it i can say this is a uh, you know this is a tall glass and there's this transparent liquid so this part is dynia okay when i'm talking about something so now the moment i'm drinking it this becomes news okay where i have internalized that something that is outside so this concept uh, this concept this object becomes a part of me it is absorbed in my consciousness it becomes existential okay this is the basis so and then once so imagine this is knowledge now i am holding knowledge and i am talking about it i am objectifying it you know i am describing about this body of work but the moment i have taken it inside it translates into wisdom so he says that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom knowledge is external wisdom is internal so i just hope you got the uh, difference uh he uses a uh, yet another analogy of driving a car so he says it's like an uh, uh, so you start with dynia where uh the first time you handle a car you're very conscious right if if uh, uh, whether you have learned to ride a two wheeler or drive a car i'm sure you will agree that the first time i hold the steering wheel and i sit i put the seat belt across and i'm trying to get my head around the uh, uh, the clutch the brake the accelerator uh, i'm doing it very consciously uh, consciously right i'm like paying attention i'm Uh, my eyes are glued on the road so uh i'm very conscious of the ac action of driving the car and i who is driving the car we are two separate entities the car is a machine and i'm handling it but when i become an expert i don't think so much about it right uh it is it comes almost automatically to me so i don't think uh that i have to put my foot on the clutch every time i change the gear i have to put my foot on the ac accelerator and press it every time i want to increase the speed of the car i have to remove my foot from one to another or i have to use the brake uh every time i want the car to stop or something so it becomes a part of my system right so once the skill is learned the object ceases to be objective so the car ceases to be separate from me it becomes a part of me it almost becomes like an extension of my personality and the learning process has moved from my conscious mind to something something which we all know as subconscious or unconscious or instinctive mind so by instinct if there's a uh, there's a dog that comes in front of my car i will pull the handbrake i don't even have to think about it because i'm so programmed uh to doing it right i have programmed myself like that right so there is a kind of unmediated unity so initially when i sit in the car and i start learning the mediator is perhaps the person who i'm learning to drive from or the mediator could also be my conscious mind uh, once my driving instructor has also finished uh, their job so but there is a mediator but once it becomes a part of my unconscious mind once i'm i have programmed the uh, the skill of driving in my system uh i don't have to consciously uh, give it a thought it is a kind of unmediated unity then there is no third person mediator uh between me and the car it is an unmediated unity so this is noose what fry is trying to tell us through this example is that this is what is noose and the separateness is dynia so when something becomes integral to me that is uh the stage of noose and that is what he believes literature should be right because as long as the teacher keeps teaching she can only be the driving instructor right uh she cannot 
make the student internalize the experience uh, so and every literary piece will have different experiences for different people so for me uh, maybe when i read a poem my react response to it could be sad or reflective when another person reads the same poem they could have a very different response to the poem because we also bring our experiences to whatever we are reading